la doctora Ana Machen, antropóloga evolutiva, es escritora, es locutora, es reconocida Ana mundialmente por su trabajo que explora la ciencia y la antropología de la paternidad y su interpretación del amor humano. Y ella ha investigado la paternidad, la familia humana en toda su diversidad, la red social humana, las relaciones románticas y la influencia de la innovación tecnológica en cómo nos comportamos y cómo eso impacta en la salud. Entonces, yo busqué a Ana porque quería entender por qué creemos lo que creemos sobre el amor, por qué amamos y se van a traumar. Pero ¿por qué Ana dice que no necesitamos el amor romántico? Y ahorita le voy a contar el drama y el trauma que traigo yo desde hace dos semanas con la serie de Bridgerton, cosa que ya comentamos ustedes y yo. My dear friend, welcome to the show. It is an honor to have you here. Thank you very much for inviting me. So when I read the title of the conversation we're going to have, which is why we do not need romantic love, you yeah. blew my mind. Let me tell you why. Two weeks ago with my husband, I watched season two of Bridgerton. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. When I finished the last episode, I told my hub husband, we need to get a divorce. <laughs> And he says, why? What's wrong with you? I cannot live thinking that for the next 30 years of our marriage, nobody is going to tell me, as Anthony told Kate, <laughs> you are the bane of my existence and the object of all my desires. <laughs> so every time I bring this up, and it's so interesting, with women and men, women's reactions are absolutely, I totally agree with you. This guy doesn't know how to flirt with me. He never says like these killer phrases. And all the men are like, I'm perfectly fine my, with my marriage the way it is, and I'm okay. So what are you talking about that we do not need romantic love when all I've been craving for the last two weeks is Anthony? I know the feeling. I watched that that as well. And, I, yes, I had lots of many happy dreams afterwards. Um, what I'm saying is not that we don't need romantic love, but I think we kind of privilege romantic love. It's like the most important love to achieve in your life. Um, so, you know, we have endless dating apps and endless dating shows on the television and that every, there's so much money made by people trying to find their perfect partner. And in part, it's that story we've been told about romance, that kind of Bridgerton story of it's, it's about finding the one and finding the passion and your soulmate and it's all going to be amazing forever. And then what you're actually talking about is reality, which is, you know, you marry your husband. I've been married for like 20 years. And maybe you had those wonderful feelings at the beginning, but then actually 20 years later, they're not quite <laughs> the same, are they? So what I was really trying to do was rebalance our perspective on love and say, actually, what's really lucky about humans is we get to love in so many different ways. So we have the love of our friends, which I think we underestimate, particularly women. I think for women, their, their female friends are really critical. But I think we underestimate the importance of the love we have for them. Uh, we have the love of our family. We have the love of our children. You know, we might have the love of a God. We have the love of our pets. You know, we have the love of so many different things in our lives. And I think maybe we've kind of just got a little overexcited about romantic love. And, and so, for some people, particularly if they're single, they feel like they failed because they haven't achieved this. And actually, we need to say, no, do you know what? There are other valuable loves out there. So let me say everything you just said in Spanish, okay? Eh, ya le digo que es que cómo crees que vamos a vivir los siguientes 30 años sin tener el amor romántico que vimos en la serie, por ejemplo, de Bridgerton con Anthony, me dice, mira, lo que pasa es que lo que está pasando es que el amor romántico está sobrevalorado, o sea, hay shows de televisión, hay aplicaciones, todo el mundo está obsesionado por buscar el amor romántico, lo cual, sin duda alguna, pues para la gente que es soltera, automáticamente los hace sentir como que son un absoluto fracaso. Pero la maravilla es que hay muchos diferentes tipos de amor y solamente los humanos tenemos la capacidad de amar de diferentes formas. Piensen, no solamente existe el amor romántico, existe el amor con los amigos, el amor con la familia, el amor que le tienes a tus animales, 
el amor que le tienes a tus hijos, el amor que le tienes a lo mejor al Dios al que tú sigues, a la religión que profesas. Entonces, hay que reenfocar el hecho de que hay muchos diferentes tipos de amor y el amor romántico no es el único que hay. Now, you are an anthropologist. So the mm -hmm. question is, I have two questions. Who, 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 who invented romantic love? Because I believe that many million years ago, the only reason why a couple existed was for survival purposes. So who invented romantic love? And is it a chemical thing? Is it something that we learned? Why are we so obsessed with it? Okay, so first of all, the first question, um, I think we have to blame the Victorians here in Britain for inventing romantic love. So the Victorian poets, the romantic poets, who came up with this idea that love shouldn't be this arrangement, this passionless arrangement to get married, to have children or to marry the right person and, and that kind of thing. So they came up with this idea that actually your heart should pound and you should feel amazing. And, and so they came up with it and it slowly spread as an idea. Now, not all cultures in the world have romantic love. They don't all believe you have to have this amazing passion to end up with your life partner. But it's growing. As we're becoming more globalized, that story is spreading around. So it's an entirely cultural construct. Love itself, the love you feel for your partner, for your children, for your friends, is a, is a chemical reaction. Yes, it absolutely is. It's a chemical reaction in your brain. And the most wonderful chemicals are involved in it. But romantic love, the idea, these, these ideas we have, they, they've all just come from, from literature, ultimately, from art, and then they've come into culture, and we've decided that's how you should feel when you fall in love with the person. Many people in many cultures marry someone, and they don't feel like that at all. And, for example, in cultures where we have arranged marriages. Yeah, like they, India. India. Yeah, they don't feel like Now, they may come into romantic love later, but they don't feel like that to, to, to be married. So... It's very much a cultural construct, yeah. remember. Eh, a ver, le, le, le pregunté que quién inventó el amor romántico, porque hace miles y cientos de años el concepto de la pareja tenía que ver más con el instinto y la necesidad de sobrevivir. Porque pues si no tenías quien te protegiera del mamut a ti y a tu descendencia, pues las probabilidades de que acabaras muerta eran muy altas. Entonces necesitabas pareja. Y me dice, mira, yo creo que a quien le tenemos que echar la culpa es a los victorianos, a la época victoriana eh, eh, inglesa, porque ellos son los que empiezan con este concepto del amor romántico, de la poesía, del de mundo color de rosa entre un hombre y una mujer. Eh, y dijeron, no puede ser que la unión de dos personas, porque antes de eso eran matrimonios arreglados, te casabas por intereses, te casabas para proteger el linaje, pero el amor no estaba en esa ecuación. De hecho, si ustedes han visto Bridgerton, el amor no era parte de la ecuación. Si se daba, que es sensacional. Entonces dice, esto es un tema totalmente cultural. Y hay muchas culturas, y puso de ejemplo, por ejemplo, eh, en India, que todavía existen los matrimonios arreglados, en donde... El amor no es parte de la ecuación. A lo mejor con el tiempo entre esa pareja se da el amor romántico. Y obviamente esto se ha ido diseminando por la globalización del mundo. Pero 100% el amor romántico es totalmente una construcción cultural y un invento de los seres humanos. Ok, so that was the first question. The second question is, ah, porque en realidad dice, let me say something else que el amor es y la pasión es un tema totalmente neuroquímico. Y ya entendimos que a los 3, 4 años esa química cambia. Entonces, sí es un tema químico, pero el romanticismo es totalmente cultural. Ok. Why do we love? We love feel the need to love. We feel the need to love because you were right. Love evolved as a way to help us survive. Now, humans are really complex species and therefore we need lots of help from everybody else to make sure we survive and we reproduce and we do all those things evolution wants us to do. So we have to cooperate with each other. 
But the problem is cooperating with each other is really difficult because, you know, people are annoying. They might be stressful. You might cooperate with them and they don't cooperate back with you. So there's lots of reasons why actually it's much better just to sit on your own. But you can't do that. So what love was is love is evolution's solution to the fact that cooperating is hard. So what we do is we fall in love with people, the people we need to cooperate with, and we get the most wonderful feelings. It's a chemical reaction in your brain of reward and euphoria and warmth and contentment. And that kind of bribes us to cooperate with these people, even though some days we don't want to because they're difficult or they're being grumpy or whatever it might be. But that's why love evolved. Now, obviously, love is much more complex than that. There are many layers to love. But at its center, the reason why it evolved was just to make sure we cooperated and survived. Yeah. So what you're saying, how interesting, is that love ended up being the glue. Mm. Yeah. Love is the glue that holds everything together. Love is the glue. So let me say that in Spanish, and then I have one more question exactly about that. Le digo, ¿y por qué amamos? Y me dice, miren, el ser humano es la cosa más compleja que hay, y obviamente el amor tiene muchas capas. Pero lo que quiero que entiendan es que, evolutivamente hablando, el corazón del amor es y nace como el pegamento para la cooperación entre unos y otros. ¿Qué quiere decir esto? En un principio, hace miles de años, para sobrevivir necesitabas cooperación de otros, ¿no? Hoy en día, para sobrevivir necesitamos cooperación. Que te ayude tu mamá, que te ayude tu papá, que te apoye tu marido, que te ayude la sociedad, que te ayude un amigo. De eso venimos arrastrando desde hace muchos años. Entonces, si pensamos que la interacción entre dos seres humanos tiende a ser compleja, porque la gente no siempre está de buenas, a veces está del peor humor, a veces te contesta mal, y es complicada, ¿cómo podríamos encontrar el pegamento para que tuvieras y quisieras cooperar con la gente que te rodeaba? Y ahí es donde nace el amor, que obviamente es un proceso neuroquímico, pero que al final acaba siendo el pegamento para que tú te sientas vinculado con la otra persona, eh, involucrado con la otra persona para aceptar su cooperación o para cooperarle. So at the end, love was born to be the glue. So you felt involved enough with a person to accept their cooperation or yes. to cooperate with them. Absolutely. And particularly to do that when they're, when it's difficult, you know, some days your family drive you mad or your children drive you mad or they're not. And they're really hard to cooperate with because actually right now you'd prefer not to, but love is the thing that kind of, yeah, bribes you, brings you to them and says, right, no, come on. You, you need to do this. You need to cooperate with them. Not, you know, everybody, you know, it won't work. It won't work. It would never work. Dice, es que sí, a veces tus hijos te caen fatal, se ponen difíciles, te llevas mal con la pareja, tienes un día muy complicado. Y entonces, si no tuvieras ese vínculo de amor, las cosas no funcionarían. Porque pues todo el mundo agarraría para su mecate. Now, thousands and millions of years ago, how did it work? How, o sea, love did not, how was love? You know what I'm saying? Because I have a new podcast on Spotify that's called Life Explained. And yes. the first episode is The History of Love. And what I learned is that many, many years ago, um, you needed somebody with you to protect you, to protect your descendants, your children. But the concept of having a couple was nothing more than that. So talk yeah. to me about those times. Yeah. So romantic love probably evolved about half a million years ago. Hmm. And that's because um, at that point, we, as anybody who's had a, a human child knows, they're really hard work. And so at that point, um, we became so difficult to raise that dads came on the, on, on the scene. Fathers started helping to raise their children. And what you needed was you needed something to keep mum and dad together so that the child had the parents to invest. And that's when the love between a couple 
came about, where romantic love came about. And yes, initially, all it was was a bond that kept them together for a reasonable period of time, maybe a few years, to make sure that that child was raised so it could survive. So it wasn't like we have today where you might, you know, have debt be together your whole lives, for example. It was probably a much shorter period of time. It's only when we started to have these rules about marriage that people started being together for a really, really long time. And that was what religion brought in and what, you know, governments and the legal system brought in. But initially it would have been maybe, yeah, maybe three, four, five years just to get that kid. Uh, yeah. Es que le digo que me cuente cómo era el amor en la época de las cavernas. Me dice, a ver, el amor nace más o menos hace 500 millones de años. Inicialmente las parejas existían simplemente para poder garantizar las probabilidades de sobrevivencia de su descendencia, que eran el bebé. Entonces, dice que probablemente las parejas solamente estaban juntas los primeros cuatro o cinco años de la vida de un niño. Probablemente hasta que ese niño pudiera aprender a correr, entender ciertos códigos para poder esconderse detrás de un árbol, una piedra, protegerse y más nada. Fue hasta que la religión y las leyes inventaron el matrimonio que las parejas empezaron a quedarse juntos muchos años más. Pero originalmente no era el plan en el que estamos ahorita, de que te casas y vas a estar juntos para siempre y vas a ver llegar a los nietos. No, inicialmente la pareja era solamente para los 3, 4, 5 años del bebé y una vez que eso sucedía ya no estaban juntos so when we come back how does genetics influence uh, love um, neurochemically what happens in our brain and obviously um, let's leave it at that we'll do a commercial break and then come back don't look. suscríbete a Marta de Baile en YouTube no te pierdas los de Baile Minutos, de Baile Talks y conoce más de Marta de Baile y nuestros especialistas. Marta de Baile 2022. Estamos de regreso y estamos donde estés. Estamos de regreso en W Radio, 11 de la mañana. Acabo de encontrar a mi mejor amiga del mundo mundial. Es la doctora Ana Machen. Ella es inglesa y ella es cuentavientes, antropóloga evolutiva. Y se ha dedicado la vida entera a explicar y entender la historia evolutiva del amor. ¿Por qué amamos? ¿De dónde viene el amor romántico? ¿Quién inventó este cuento de estar en pareja? ¿No saben qué joya de conversación? Estoy haciendo mi mejor esfuerzo por traducirla, miren, palabra por palabra para que ustedes entiendan perfecto de lo que estamos hablando. Y eh, si se perdieron la primera media hora de Ana, lo tienen que escuchar porque van a entender muy bien de dónde vino este cuento del amor romántico, cuántos años tiene en la historia de la humanidad y lo pueden rescatar en podcast, en Spotify o en wradio.com.mx. Tengo dos preguntas más para Ana en el tintero. ¿Cuál es la influencia genética que tienen que ver los genes con el amor? Y segundo, eh, bueno, voy a pedirle que me conteste eso primero. So, what is the genetic influence in love? Okay, so your genes do have a role in how you feel when you're in love and how you behave when you're in love because we're all different. Our experiences of love differ. So how I feel when I'm in love and how you feel when you're in love are going to be different. And part of that is down to your genes. And so the genes that we look at are the genes which underpin all that lovely neurochemistry in your brain. And they will uh, influence things like how likely you are to be in a romantic relationship. So how motivated are you actually to find that other person? They will influence things like uh, how you behave when, in, when you're in a relationship. So are you, do you... Are you always worried that your partner's going to leave you? Do you spend a lot of time either clinging to your partner or pushing your partner away? Or are you really comfortable in relationships? Or they might influence how good you are at some of the skills of relationship maintenance. So like emotional vulnerability. How vulnerable are you in front of your other partner? Because that's really important for a strong relationship. Or another one is they might influence how good you are at empathy. So empathy is the ability to understand someone's emotional state. And it's really important in love. 
really important you can do that but how good you are at it is is underpinned in part by your genes so there's lots of genes that underpin these different things there's even a gene that influences the likelihood that you will be single excuse me so there is a gene they found it a few years ago which seems to be carried by people who tend to be single they tend to maybe have not had any long-term relationships um if they have they haven't had many and it seems to, it's it's associated with serotonin which is one of the chemicals in your brain involved in love and those people who carry it are much more likely to be single no, no, so no. the reason why you are no, single no. is partly dr, dr. Martin, we have to make a show just talking about that gene also there's yes. so many single people that do not understand why they're single we definitely have to make a show based on that. Okay, let me say that in Spanish. Okay. Le digo que qué tiene que ver la genética con el amor y me dice, a ver, los genes tienen una gran influencia en cómo vives el amor. Cuando ustedes han estado enamorados, es diferente a cómo están enamorados uno de sus amigos, cómo estoy enamorada yo, cómo es Ana cuando está enamorada ella, y eso tiene que ver con genética. Y puede influenciar no solamente... Eh, los niveles de empatía que puedas tener con una persona, qué tanto apego tienes, si eres una persona naturalmente ansiosa en el amor, si tienes esta angustia de abandono, si eres una de esas personas que es como muégano y cuando está enamorada se pega. Eso tiene que ver mucho con genética. Y me acaba de dar una revelación horrenda que les prometo que vamos a hacer un programa de esto. La genética ha encontrado que muy probablemente hay un gen de la soltería. O se estudiaron que todas aquellas personas que son solteras, que nunca están en una relación de largo plazo, tienen un gen en común. O sea, que puede ser que sí exista el gen de la soltería. Y le dije, no, oye, tenemos que hacer un programa de eso, porque yo sé muchos de ustedes cuentavientes están solteros y que les encantará entender si a lo mejor el gran problema y contra lo que están batallando es en realidad la genética. Ahora, mi pregunta va a ser, ¿y habrá un gene de la pasión? So, there's people, Ana, who are naturally super passionate. Yeah. And people who are not. Is that yeah. genetics? Some of it's genetics, some of it is psychological, and a lot of it's to do with how you were brought up. So some of it is to do your genes and some people naturally are experience a, like a greater euphoria when they're in love. And that's because they have higher levels of these wonderful love chemicals in their brains. So they, when they fall in love, fall much more passionately than maybe another person does. But also how you were brought up and particularly how you were cared for when you were a tiny child and the relationships you saw then also influence how you Uh, behave in your relationships, how you experience relationships when you're older. It's like the relationship you have with your parents or with your carer when you're little kind of molds your brain so that you behave in a certain way when you're in relationships. So, for example, if you were brought up in a really loving relationship and your needs were met and you felt safe and secure, then you are much more likely to have really good, healthy relationships when you're older. But if you were brought up, maybe you were, unfortunately, it wasn't very loving or you were neglected then unfortunately people who are brought up in that way, that changes their brains to a certain extent. And that means they find it much, much harder to deal with love and relationships when they're older. Claro. Le digo que si existe el gen de la pasión, porque hay gente súper apasionada y gente que es menos clavada. Y me dice, bueno, eso tiene que ver con genética, pero también tiene que ver con eh, pues tu personalidad, tu temperamento y la forma en que creciste. Me dice, muy probablemente si tú creciste en una familia amorosa, adorada, este, en donde fuiste amado, protegido, en donde tuviste buenos ejemplos. Increíblemente, eso no solamente es un aprendizaje psicológico, sino que moldea tu cerebro y las probabilidades de que tengas buenas relaciones cuando crezcas son mucho más grandes. Eh, no así si creciste en una casa en donde te faltó cariño, en donde no te hacían caso, en donde los adultos que te rodeaban no estaban emocionalmente disponibles, pues obviamente eh, tu cerebro estará moldeado de otra manera y por eso hay que ir a terapia cuenta bien. Now, during the commercial break, I said I was going to ask you a question and I just forgot again. <laughs> Jesus, Mother Mary, what question was that? It That's was what my, I was with. romantic love so addictive. Ah, yeah, exactly. God, I love your memory. Okay, 
¿Por qué el amor romántico es tan adictivo? Let me explain this in Spanish. ¿Por qué hay personas que se quedan clavadas para toda la vida en las mariposas? De hecho, yo tengo amigos que me dicen, no, yo salgo seis meses con una chava. Y cuando ya se me pasa el, bye, next. Entonces hay gente que es adicta a esa emoción. Y todos los que estamos casados sabemos que en el año 7, 11 o 20, no sientes lo que sentías en el mes 1. Entonces, what I said in Spanish is, I have friends who are truly addicted to those butterflies and those neurochemicals. Mm -hmm. And they say that, you know, six months into the relationship, they'll break up with the girl and on to the next because they want to continue feeling that. And all of us that are married know that year seven, 11 or 20, you do not feel what you felt month one. So yeah. why is it so addictive? It's this, well, the several answers to that question. First of all, what they're addicted to actually isn't love. They're addicted to lust and passion and they're different things. So lust and passion are underpinned by a different set of neurochemicals than long-term love. So what they really love is they love that euphoric rush you get from, from the attraction stage of a relationship. And, and that's the passionate stage of, of love because there's a lot of lust involved. There's a lot of sex hormones involved. You know, it feels amazing. Your heart beats fast. The adrenaline's up, you know. However, yeah, after a period of time, that will tail off. And that goes into what we call companionate love. And companionate love is war, what we would call real love. It's that calm, warm, secure feeling and that's underpinned by a different chemical known as beta endorphin so what they're actually addicted to is lust and passion and ex and the excitement and the adrenaline of the of like the first stages of the attraction of somebody um, and maybe they struggle a bit when that kind of tails off and you get yeah. more into and you know you love but, but, but when we, we've talked about the chemistry of breakups um mm -hmm. when you break up with somebody Mm. It, it almost feels like when you stop smoking or stop drinking alcohol or stop doing drugs. Yeah. It, doesn't the same thing happen chemically in the body? Yeah. So particularly long-term love is underpinned by beta endorphin, which is an opiate. It's heroin. What, what is it called? Beta endorphin. Beta endorphin. Okay. That underpins long-term love and that's an opiate. So it's the same as morphine or heroin. It's addictive. And it's released when you're in a long-term relationship and you're interacting with the person. So if they, yeah, let's say they break up with you, you go from existing at quite a high level of opiate in your bloodstream to nothing. So it's like somebody, like, it's like a heroin addict, someone going, right, you're not taking heroin anymore. So you completely crash. You crash in your body because your body is used to dealing with all this lovely chemistry. So your body's something like actually in physical pain because you're withdrawing yeah. and psychologically you're withdrawing from this, from this wonderful feeling because we know B endorphin underpins things like our pain system. It underpins our good mental and physical health. So if you take it away, you feel awful. And that's yeah. why you feel awful after a breakup. You're, and you're some people have a gene which makes breaking up much, much more painful. Poor thing. They do. Oh, my God. Es que le digo que por qué es tan adictivo, ¿no? Entonces me dice, ve, la gente que dice que está adicta al amor, no está adicta al amor. A lo que está adicto es a esa fase de pasión, de lujuria, de sexo, que produce toda esta serie de neuroquímicos que tiene que ver con la dopamina, con la serotonina, con la noradrenalina. Eh, obviamente están... Eh, a todo lo que da, el corazón te palpita, traes un rush impresionante y eso es muy diferente al amor maduro o al amor verdadero que tiene que ver más con las beta endorfinas y que realmente, a diferencia de la pasión y la lujuria y el sexo y la adrenalina, el amor real es más un sentimiento de calorcito, de seguridad, de paz. Y las beta endorfinas, que son las que, digamos, influencian o influencian el amor maduro o real, son, un, son muy parecidas a cómo funcionan eh, los opioides o la morfina en el cuerpo. Entonces te dan esta sensación 
placentera, de paz. Ahora, le digo yo, cuando hemos hablado de la neuroquímica de la ruptura, ¿por qué te sientes que te vas a morir cuando truenas con el fulano o la fulana? Eh, tal cual se siente de mal alguien que está en un proceso de desintoxicación de heroína, alcohol, cocaína, cigarro, mota, lo que me digan. Y me dice, claro, lo que pasa es que imagínate tú que estas beta endorfinas y todos estos neuroquímicos te hacen sentir tranquilidad, placer, emoción y bienestar. Si tú ahorita le quitas a un heroinómano la heroína, se va a sentir fatal porque ya no tiene esas betas endorfinas, estas betas endorfinas y más obviamente el impacto psicológico que tiene. Entonces esto eh, en cuestión de salud física, claro que sientes que te vas a morir y te sientes fatal y es real que físicamente te está pasando. Y aparte nos dijo otra noticia y obviamente voy a hacer un programa con ella, que si sí existe gente que tiene un gen en donde las rupturas le son todavía más dolorosas que a cualquier otra persona. Déjenme decirles que Ana tiene un libro que todavía no lo han escrito en español, pero se llama Why We Love, The New Science Behind Our Closest Relationships. Eh, les pongo ahorita en Twitter la portada del libro para que lo vean, pero es una joya y por supuesto tendremos a Ana de regreso para hablar del gen de la soltería y el gen de estar devastado cuando cortas. So, my dear new friend, we have to do part two and three. Okay. Single gene mm -hmm. and the devastated breakup gene. Yeah. Okay, we can do that. And you need to have that, that book published in Spanish. I will work at it. We will make it happen. For sure. Eh, si quieren seguir a la doctora Ana Machen, eh, antropóloga evolutiva, es anamachen.com en Twitter es dr a machen I send you a big kiss. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. See you soon. Yeah, bye. Bye.